So we'll be joined by Zach Groff. Zach is a PhD student in economics at Stanford University. His current research interests are in welfare economics, behavioral e economics, and applied economics, uh, applied microeconomics, sorry, with an eye towards researching long run change for all sentient beings. He previously was a research analyzer, uh, sorry, research analyst on randomized evaluations of poverty alleviation policies at Innovations Pro Poverty Action and Evidence-Based Policy Promotion at Northwestern University's Global Poverty Research Lab. Please join me in welcoming Zach. Thank you. So today I'm going to be presenting on a paper I wrote with Yu Kuang En, an economist at Fudan University who anticipated many of the ideas in effective altruism decades earlier through work on utilitarianism. And our paper is called Does Suffering Dominate Enjoyment in the Animal Kingdom? An Update to Welfare Biology. The core of our paper is a correction to an error in a 1995 paper by my co-author N, in which uh, he studied the idea of welfare biology and really proposed in one of the first uh, academic papers on the subject that we study wild animal well-being systematically. Among the many perceptive conclusions he offered, he had one proposition that said that suffering is doomed to dominate enjoyment in the wild based on a number of reasonable assumptions. It turns out that this finding, that suffering should dominate enjoyment in nature based on the assumptions offered in that paper is actually incorrect. And when the error is fixed, the balance of suffering and enjoyment can go either way. That's to say, you could have more suffering than enjoyment, more enjoyment than suffering. And I should also just note that I'm gonna be using the terms suffering, pain, enjoyment, happiness, and so on, fairly casually, noting that these are often controversial terms. There's a lot of debates in economics about whether you can quantify these things, whether you can compare them. I'm gonna take that as granted and see what we can get if we assume that that is possible. Revisiting this theory, I think is a promising thing to look at as we're starting to establish organizations in wild animal welfare because the paper was one of the earliest papers to look at this question. So in his 1995 paper, N asks three questions. The first is which animals have experiences and specifically which animals have experiences that can be said to be positive or negative because those are the experiences we're concerned about when we're trying to improve well-being. Next, he asks which, uh, whether their well-being is positive or negative and how we can figure that out. And then finally, he looks at the question of what we can do to help wild animals. In addressing whether animals have positive or negative well-being, he arrives at what he calls the Buddhist premise, which says that under the assumptions of concave and symmetrical functions relating costs to enjoyment and suffering, we should have a dominance of suffering over enjoyment. And I'm going to go over those conditions in a bit. This was one of the first papers to look at this question. And to date, most of the papers, the vast majority of the papers on the issue are dealing with the moral question of what our obligations are toward wild animals. And there are very few that try to tackle the descriptive question of what it's like to be a wild animal. This is also a paper that is cited and commonly discussed in effective altruism circles. The conditions that N uses to derive this Buddhist premise are listed on the left. First, N posits that suffering and enjoyment serve to increase evolutionary fitness by inducing organisms to engage in behaviors that increase their chances of reproductive success and discourage organisms from engaging in behaviors that detract from reproductive success. So this is an assumption about the reasons that positive and negative emotions exist that basically ties the positive emotions to behaviors that are selected for and the negative ones to behaviors that are not selected for. Now, if it's the case that, in fact, positive and negative emotions have this kind of steering, reinforcing effect on behavior to induce behavior that uh, increases reproductive success, then there has to be some reason we don't have infinite amounts of enjoyment and suffering. So N assumes that enjoyment and suffering must be costly to produce. There must be some type of evolutionary cost to an organism experiencing enjoyment and suffering. Furthermore, and assumes that these costs increase with the magnitude of suffering or enjoyment. That's to say that as you invest more in creating a positive or negative experience, you get less bang for your buck as the investment increases. 
So in this graph from the 95 paper, the x-axis is the costs of suffering or enjoyment, so the amount of resources invested in producing a certain experience, and then the y-axis is the experience, uh, the magnitude and direction of the experience. And so this second condition is basically saying that as you increase the amount invested, the costs of enjoyment or suffering, the curve flattens out. Finally, and assumes that the costs are similar for enjoyment and suffering, that there's not really any reason to think that it should be easier to produce the sensation of happiness or the sensation of, of suffering. So under these conditions, N arrives at the Buddhist premise. And I should also note that for symmetry, you don't necessarily need the functions to be exactly the same, you just need them to be similar enough. We show that in fact, when you do the math right, you arrive at this revised Buddhist premise. So the revised Buddhist premise looks largely the same under the assumption of symmetrical functions relating cost to enjoyment and suffering. Evolutionary economizing results in the excess of total suffering over total enjoyment if the square of each function is concave. So now rather than needing this condition I showed before uh, in which we need the enjoyment produced for a certain cost to flatten out, we need the squared enjoyment to flatten out. Now this might sound kind of weird and technical and you might not know what that means. And I think that's actually the right reaction to have. There's not really much of intuitive take on what this means or whether we should expect this condition to hold. This is the math more specifically. So for those of you who have taken say intermediate economics, this might look familiar. Essentially N sets up what we call an optimization problem where you want to maximize or, or evolution selects for genes that maximize the total amount of enjoyment and suffering because enjoyment serves to induce behaviors that increase reproductive success and suffering discourages behaviors that detract from it. You could also think of suffering as negative enjoyment in which case this would be the difference between what you experience when you do the behavior that increases your chance of reproductive success and what you do when you engage in the behavior that detracts from it. Now the costs of enjoyment and suffering, importantly, on the second line, are weighted by the probability of experiencing enjoyment or success and suffering or failure. That's to say that N here is the number of organisms failing or suffering for every organism succeeding and achieving enjoyment. And the reason that this, is, that this is weighted this way is that evolution is going to select for genes that minimize the expected cost of suffering and enjoyment. So that cost is going to be weighted by how likely you are to experience these things. Now when you take this, this problem that N sets up in the 95 paper, you do not actually get the result that you need the functions to be, or that the functions being concave lead suffering to dominate enjoyment you get the result that instead you have this condition, it's the same as this, which says that the square of the functions must be concave for suffering to dominate enjoyment in nature. Now as I said, this inequality really does not give rise to any obvious intuition, at least anyone I've spoken to. If it, if it gives rise to an intuition in you, let me know. Uh, and, and so based on this, we arrive at basically complete uncertainty based on this model. The model cannot tell us whether suffering or enjoyment dominate. A lot of functions that seem plausible have the property that the square of the function is concave and a lot of ones don't. And sometimes functions have this property in some parts of their domain and do not have it in other parts of their domain. Now I would just note that N gives two arguments for thinking that there's more suffering than enjoyment in nature. So one argument is this mathematical argument that we're discussing and correcting an error to. The other argument is an intuitive argument similar to the one you often hear in effective altruism circles that you have all of these species of animals where there's large numbers of offspring who die shortly after being born of starvation or something like this. And that based on that, it seems that there should be more suffering than enjoyment in nature. So our uh, error that we fix is is an error in the mathematical argument and it does not directly challenge that intuitive argument. Once we find this result that you can't say which way the balance goes, 
A question that might arise is whether you can make additional assumptions to kind of flesh this out more. The assumptions that N makes to arrive at this Buddhist premise may seem pretty speculative, but given the strength of that premise, they're actually fairly weak. So what happens if we assume a specific function, a specific relationship between the costs and investment in producing suffering and enjoyment and the amount produced by that? We assume a logarithmic function where the enjoyment or suffering produced by certain costs is logarithmic in the cost. And uh, this is based on some very, very speculative reasons. I just want to note, I would not assume this in general. We just assume this for the sake of illustrating and kind of exploring the dynamics in the model. The first reason is called the Weber-Fechner law in psychology. And this is a finding that the reaction to a change in a stimulus is proportional to the initial magnitude of the stimulus. So a change in the length of the line is noticed in proportion to how long the line is. And also happiness studies in economics have found that happiness increases logarithmically with income. Now these require huge leaps in analogies. So again, this is very speculative. We do this purely for the sake of being able to illustrate the model a little bit and play around with it to see what we can find. We find that even with this more specific function for costs, we still get this anything goes result that the balance can go either way. Two things happen that explain this result, that you could have net suffering or net enjoyment in nature. And the first thing is that when you have a lot of organisms being born and then immediately dying or in some way uh, failing reproductively, obviously the number of organisms suffering increases. You have a lot more organisms experiencing whatever these organisms experience. But at the same time, each failing organism suffers less under this model. So again, this is not to say that this is necessarily true in general, but under the model here, what we find is that as this number n increases, that's the number of organisms failing for every one that succeeds increases, it becomes more costly to invest in suffering because the cost is weighted by the probability of failing or succeeding. And so because of that, if you have, say, if you compare, say, a species of animals where 50% of the offspring succeed and 50% do not, and then a species where one of every 100 succeeds and the other 99 out of every 100 die shortly after birth, this model suggests that the latter, in the latter case, each one of those 99 that fail should suffer less. So the balance can go either way. And not only is it the case that the actual balance of suffering or enjoyment can go either case, we can't even find a relationship between the rate of evolutionary failure and the balance of suffering or enjoyment. So it could be that as the likelihood of dying an early death increases, it becomes more likely that the species experience net, net suffering, or it could become more likely that it experiences net enjoyment. And so this graph is an illustration of that. On the x-axis, we have this number n, so the number of animals uh, dying or fail failing to achieve reproductive success. And on the y-axis, we have the net amount of suffering. So zero means that there's equal amount of suffering or enjoyment. And then as you go up, suffering dominates. As you go down, enjoyment dominates. m is a number whose meaning is honestly up open to interpretation. and I wouldn't give too much weight to the exact meaning of, N, of M. In our model, M was basically the amount of total costs of suffering or enjoyment. So one kind of, one interpretation might be the size of the organism or the intensity of experiences, but I, I again would caution that this is very speculative. But the deeper point here is that by altering a parameter in the equation, you can basically get the balance of suffering or enjoyment not only to be positive or negative, you can get it to go down as your probability of failing to reproduce increases, or you can get it to go up. So where does this leave us? A lot of people are, uh, say that this is cause for optimism, and because we can update away from a result saying that there was net suffering in nature, I would note that this does not show that there's net enjoyment in nature, that there's a balance of suffering or enjoyment in nature. Our result just says that from this model, we cannot derive a finding. 
But I think there's cause for optimism in research uh, in that I think that working with this model kind of shows a way we can make progress on high level questions in wild animal welfare. So I propose a kind of three step process to pursuing research on this that starts with first listing and thinking of all the possible evolutionary explanations for suffering or enjoyment. So this is sort of at the intersection of philosophy of mind, evolutionary biology. Once we have these explanations, trying to see what are the empirical facts we would expect to see in the world if these explanations hold. So this requires thinking about what it actually means to say the costs of suffering or enjoyment. Does it mean the energy cost? Does it mean some type of side effect that experiencing intense emotions is distracting? What, what, what do we mean when we say costs? And then also, how can we quantify the intensity of these experiences? And there's probably a number of different measures for any, any of these things, measures yet to be developed. But I think by thinking about these measures and trying to explore these relationships, we might be able to say, OK, there are facts that don't seem to match a certain evolutionary picture and do seem to match this other picture. And then based on that, we can take our cost functions and go through this type of exercise uh, that I showed a few slides ago, this sort of optimization problem, and, and then arrive at a sense of which way the balance is likely to go. And most likely, that's going to lead to results that are much more fine-grained fine and, and less broad and, and, and obvious than the Buddhist premise and more kind of in this situation, you would expect more suffering, and in this situation, you would expect less. But that should allow us to make some progress on these issues. Finally, I would note that, well, rarely do you hear the mathematical argument from this paper mentioned in EA discussions. You don't hear people talking about the optimization problem or the specifics of this paper. The intuition behind the paper, I think, does still have some relation to some relationship to the mathematical model in this effect where the amount of suffering each organism experiences goes down as the rate of suffering goes up. But moreover, if you look at the academic literature and even the non-academic literature on wild animal suffering, you do see a lot of citations to this paper or to other papers citing this paper for the claim that suffering dominates enjoyment. And so I think even if we're not consciously thinking of or making the mathematical argument in their heads, there's a chance that we anchored on it or that some of us have anchored on the result. And to the extent that's the case, this is cause for an update towards a more uncertain view of the balance of enjoyment and suffering in nature. And through a combination of the steps I laid out before of using theory from evolutionary biology, philosophy, neuroscience, economics, and empirical study, we can make further progress on answering these high-level questions. Thank you. Once again, just a quick reminder that we do have some opportunity for Q&A at the end of the session, and you guys can submit questions through the Bizabo app. So our discussant for this session will be Michelle Graham. Michelle is a researcher at Wild Animal Initiative. Her projects have included work on research and intervention prioritization and categorization. In addition, she's currently pursuing a PhD in engineering mechanics at Virginia Tech, and her dissertation focuses on the movement behaviors of jumping and gliding snakes. Previously, Michelle studied physics and philosophy at the University of Oxford and has worked with animals in shelter, veterinary, farm, and zoo environments. Please join me in welcoming Michelle. Hello? Okay. Yeah, so um, I think this is a really interesting paper, and overall I'm very optimistic about the possibilities that we have in the future for uh, economic-style approaches and biology-style approaches to come together and make like really good progress on broad questions in wild animal welfare. Um, I'm just going to make a point that I think Zach will totally <laughs> agree with, that at the moment we have very, very little empirical data about uh, anything in nature uh, and that is kind of relevant to these things. So in general, a principle of using models is that you need to be able to check your assumptions against data. At the moment, I think we don't have enough data to assess the assumptions of Zach's model. Uh, and then also add its prediction, like take its predictions and, and test those against results and we don't even have framework in welfare biology right now for like checking the results with models. So I think at the moment we are, should really be thinking about models as uh, hypothesis generators and 
as Zach does, use them as ways to explore further questions and, and ask what kinds of questions we might be asking to better inform our models. Um, one thing I like particularly want to explore with you, Zach, I think we had a little bit of a discussion about this earlier that would be interesting for people to, to hear on, is this, this issue that in economics there's this like, common practice of, of optimizing, uh, of like, you know, asking like, what's the optimal of that, that cost function. Uh, but evolution uh, rarely truly is able to optimize on individual traits because there are a lot of constraints in, uh, in evolution where animals carry genetic baggage and uh, their, their history of like their ancestors like way into the past govern, govern like how they're able to evolve now. So an example would be like the human backbone. If you were going to genetically or like if you were going to engineer a biped, you would not make your spine the way that our spine is. Uh, but because our evolutionary history is in the trees, we have traits that are adapted for arboreal life that have now moved into terrestrial environments. And so if you were to ask, like it, it, it seems to me that under that framework, it's quite sometimes complicated to optimize under these like totally unknown sets of constraints. And I wonder how you might think about that under an yeah. economics framework. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I think, uh, as we talked about yesterday, I think this is a very, very good point, and it makes complete sense, and it ultimately underlines why in the second to last slide, when I was talking about the steps in proceeding in research, the first step is thinking of the different theories in evolutionary biology about this, because from an economic standpoint, you know, this is not something I would ever have thought of. You know, my, my thought was like, let's think of all of the relationships between cost and suffering in the optimization problem rather than like, what type of problem do we want to have to begin with? Um, so, so I think that makes complete sense. And I think, I think more generally in economics, we assume that things get optimized on a global scale, which is, this is an assumption that's troubling, not just when we're going outside of our field, even in our field, you know, we assume people optimize in general when often it's, it's a local optimum or not even an optimum. So I think, it, I think this is, a, a good example of that, and uh, and I think that this is a reason why we need to constantly be in dialogue with people who've thought about evolutionary dynamics in wild animals before. Okay, so we have a few questions from the audience. Um, so one question asks, what evidence is there, or is there evidence that premature death equates to suffering? Well, that's a big question. Uh, <laughs> there, I, I think the evidence on this, I mean, the evidence on all of these wild animal welfare questions is very uncertain. Uh, we, this is a question that despite all of the research in biology that has been done for a long time, no one has actually really been focused on this question for that long. Uh, so, you know, there, there are people in effective altruism who talked about this, and in the context of wild animal suffering, Brian Tomasek's essays have been, I think, pretty influential, although I think, uh, I think the view that suffering dominates enjoyment in nature is kind of, has been moderated somewhat among people working at wild animal welfare nonprofits, but in general, there's a lot of discussion there of this kind of early death phenomenon where you just have you know, 2,000 offspring, one survives and the others die. Um, but, but I think more broadly, it's kind of just a, a fairly, it's often a very quick, intuitive claim that if you have 2,000 offspring and one survives and the others all die, that means you just, the dying ones presumably have a pretty bad life. And, and that's kind of how the argument goes, so. Um, I would also just say that I think it's more intuitive for animals that are more closely related to us, uh, the specifically the relationship between failing to reproduce and welfare. Uh, if you take the example of like you social insects or like, I don't know, like ants or something where like the vast majority of ants are not reproductively active and just the queens are, like that isn't necessarily a strong claim. Uh, so it's, you know, you need to moderate relative to how much you know about the way the animal works. Okay, we have another question that says, um, or this audience member claims that the premise that greater intensity enjoyment or suffering um, having a higher cost is counterintuitive. Suppose there's no difference in cost. Does that have implications for whether um, net experience is positive or negative? 
Yeah, so we actually talked about this yesterday that this idea of costs is kind of counterintuitive. And the first thing I'd say is I think there's a bunch of pictures that don't line up to there is a, you know, f a specific cost of suffering or enjoyment that's more like there's this kind of complex web of connections between suffering, enjoyment, and other things. And through this complex web of costs, as suffering goes up, these other kind of good things go up, some good things go down, some bad things, and, and it kind of, and this is kind of a way of approximating that web of connections uh, that somewhere through that web of connections you have to have something making it so you can't have an infinite amount of suffering or enjoyment. So, so the reason that we really need this assumption here is because when you're doing this optimization model, if it's cost free and if enjoyment and suffering help reward and punish behavior, then you would just have, uh, and, and it doesn't kind of stop at a certain point, you just have an infinite amount of suffering and enjoyment. And so for that reason, in this type of model, you need this assumption. But I, I do think it's, it's a point well taken that this may not be an accurate way of describing it. And if that's the case, you need to rethink kind of the way of setting up the problem. Yeah, I just also say that there's like, it's reasonable to sort of think of, uh, if, if pain is truly, you know, this is again hypothesis, but if pain is in fact a reinforcement learning mechanism, it is like common for reinforcement learning mechanisms to have diminishing returns. Like if you punish something for behaving a certain way uh, and you, you continue to do that and over and over and over again, you can get learned helplessness, for example, where the animal just like stops responding to the stimulus at all. So like it's not a totally unreasonable thing, it's just something we certainly don't have a lot of empirical data on. And this might be a good wrap-up question. Um, what are your own best guesses as to the predominance of suffering in nature? <laughs> I think my attitude would be to basically say we're uncertain and <laughs> proceed as we would with complete uncertainty. So, I mean, my take is people have asked me, does this mean that wild animal suffering is a lower priority because the scale is less? And I actually don't think that's the case. I mean, we didn't show that there are fewer wild animals out there. Honestly, this doesn't really probably show that there's like more or less suffering out there per se. It's kind of like a, a difference around whether it's more suffering or than enjoyment. But, but still, like the total, if you thought that there's a large amount of suffering out there before, I think you should still think that. Main, the main thing it does is it kind of suggests that uh, any kind of radical action based on thinking that there's not suffering, we should maybe pause before engaging in. I definitely agree, and also refuse to answer the question. <laughs> um, but I will say uh, uh, further that I think even if we knew for certain that average net welfare in the wild was positive, which is something that most people think about humans, that doesn't mean you abandon the problem of wild animal welfare. Like, we care about human welfare even though the average human potentially has a good life. Like, it's not that average net welfare being positive or negative doesn't say there are no problems or like all problems are fixed. Like I definitely encourage people to think more about just this single number as a metric of the, the scale of animal problems. Animal problems are really important because there are tons of animals and animals matter and if they face problems, those problems are high in magnitude. Well, that's a great way to end this session. So let's give it up for Zach and Michelle.